everyone. Thanks for your patience um, as we get ready here. But welcome to our My Horse University and Extension Horse Quest live webcast on feeding and care of mules and donkeys. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Amy McLean, an equine lecturer and equine extension specialist for the University of Wyoming. She teaches equine science courses, coaches the collegiate horse judging team, and serves as an advisor for the UW Collegiate Horsemen's Association and the UW Polo team. Dr. McLean earned her PhD from Michigan State University in the area of equine science, focused on donkey training, management, and welfare. And she's worked with donkeys and mules for years. She actively participates in the industry, showing all-around mules at national shows, including Bishop Mule Days, Bishop California, the Great Celebration Mule and Donkey Show in Shelbyville, Tennessee, and the Houston, Houston Livestock Show Mule and Donkey Show in Houston. And... Um, she has shown and ridden many world and national champion mules. So please note that you are able to ask questions, as most of you have found the text chat on the left of your screen. And um, we'll try to answer those throughout and also go back at the end and get any that we missed. And we are going to record our presentation tonight, and that will be posted to our website, myhorseuniversity.com, by the end of the week. And at this time, I'll turn the presentation over. Thank you, Amanda. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, hopefully so. All right, so tonight I'm basically gonna go through some basic management care in terms of how to feed animals with really big ears, um, as well as just some general tips in terms of management that's probably helpful to most people that own mules and donkeys because there's really not a lot of research that's available. Um, there's a lot of information that is available online but I caution anybody that goes online to find information. Some of it is facts and a lot of it, um, they're myths and fallacies. So most of the information I'm gonna share with you today is information that comes from both my practical experience dealing with mules and donkeys for about over 20 years, I'm not gonna tell my age, but for quite a while, as well as scientific studies that have been conducted. You'll find throughout the presentation that most of the scientific studies predominantly focus on donkeys, and there's even less information that is scientific information available for mules. So I'll try to use my practical experience um, and the few studies that have been done on mules to incorporate that into this uh, presentation tonight. Um, okay, so one thing I think is always important, and I, I bring this out in a lot of my basic equine management classes, is to really look at how many mules and donkeys are out there. We kind of tend to think that it's a niche market, there's not a lot of mules and donkeys, but when you look at the world equine population, which is over 100 million animals, equine that is, and this was done by the Food and Ag um, Organization in 2002, so this is an estimate, but you know, there's approximately 100 million equids in the world almost half of those equine have big ears, okay? They're either donkeys or there's some sort of cross between a donkey and a horse, either a mule or a henny. The other interesting factor is the fact that 90% of these animals are found in developing countries and they're having to work for a living. Yet we still know very little about what makes a donkey or a mule healthy and why. So I just think that's something really important to point out. So what do we do with mules and donkeys today? Um, this is just a slide that kind of covers basically anything you could do with a horse from gated mules to dressage, racing mules, pleasure, cutting, um, trail riding. Um, you can do with a donkey or mule. And because of this animal's um, great agility and athletic potential, they've really drawn a lot of people into the mule world. Um, a lot of people start out wanting to own a mule because they want to go on a trail ride and um, they don't ride horses down in the Grand Canyon because they're pretty sure-footed. So um, anyhow, so a lot of people are attracted to mules because they are so athletic and they really have a unique personality. So um, they're, really, they're really great animals. Um, they can do anything a horse can do. All right, so the things that we're gonna focus on today are some of the differences between donkeys and mules in terms of management, how you take care of them, as well as um, some of the differences between the two. Um, I will not talk specifically about hennies, and I apologize if any of the listeners today are henny owners, and 
for those of y'all who are just learning about mules and donkeys, a henny is the cross between um, a stallion and a female donkey, a jenny. There tends to be not as many hennies, but um, a lot of people don't keep registration papers on these hybrids. So, and there's really no anatomical differences when you look at a henny compared to a mule. Even though you will read they're smaller and they're longer and all that, but it's really hard to detect the difference in a henny or a mule just looking at their phenotypic characteristics. So anyway, I will lump the hennies into our mule category, okay? Um, and just to point out these two pictures that I have today, I've got a column of donkey pictures here. Uh, let's see here, is that gonna work? Um, so the black donkey right up top, if you notice, she's in good body condition, but she has a huge fat roll over her neck. We'll talk about why she has that. The donkey below that is a friend of mine's donkey that's won a lot of national and world champions, championships, and this donkey is also in extremely good condition, but due to the nature and the genetics of a donkey, you'll notice there's some areas across the ribs where fat has been deposited as well as back around the tail head. Even though this donkey is worked continually and it's fed very carefully, it's still kind of the nature and the genetics uh, that predispose a donkey to depositing fat deposition. Over on the other column, I've got a donkey, I'm sorry, a mule um, that was in India. I went to India last year. Um, and amazingly, this animal is in pretty good shape in terms of body condition and the way it's being cared for. And then below that, we have a mule that's been shown a lot um, that's in what I would consider ideal fit and shape. But we're going to talk about how to manage these animals so they all continue, the donkeys and mules, to look like these images that I'm sharing with you. Okay, so first and foremost, Foremost, I think one of the things that people find most difficult with our long-eared um, equine is how to feed these animals. And honestly, it's not rocket science. These animals live in places where a lot of times horses can't live, and I'm surprised that humans can even live there. Um, so they're very efficient at digesting feed. So the number one rule with mules and donkeys in an industrial country, such as the US or Europe or other places like that, is not to overfeed them. Um, and for those of y'all who've had mules or donkeys for years, you already know that. Um, but, but why is it such an issue? And we'll touch on that a little bit today. Um, in general, and again, for those of y'all who have mules and donkeys, you'll notice that your young growing mules and even some of your young donkeys, especially your mammoth donkeys, they tend to be harder to keep weight on, um, especially a, a mule that's out of a gated type mare or a thoroughbred mare. Seems like until they get to be four or five, it's a lot of times hard to get some finish over their hips and really put weight on them. Um, and the same is true for some of your mammoth donkeys. Um, once both have matured, both the mule as well as the donkey, and um, I tend to believe a lot of our mules will mature later, like your warm bloods, then the issue is keeping the weight off. So we go from thin to then worrying about obesity. Um, and that's definitely a problem if we're not monitoring their feed intake, if we're not exercising them, and then how we're managing them. Okay, so in 2007, there was kind of a big breakthrough for, for donkeys in terms of nutritional requirements. Um, the NRC, the National Research Council, which uh, produces a very comprehensive book on nutrient requirements for horses, actually included in their sixth edition a whole chapter on donkeys in terms of nutritional requirements as well as wild equids, uh, primarily wild equids that were kept in zoos such as zebras and um, wild ass breeds and things like that. Unfortunately, again, there was no information or much mention to how to feed a mule. So, you know, I just I would like to point that out. But if you're looking for a really good text or reference, I would like to advise you to look at the NRC um, the requirements of horses, the sixth edition. Um, that will give you more technical information on dry matter intake, uh, gastrointestinal time, microbial populations, and everything sciencey you ever want to learn about the nutrition of donkey you could probably find in this text. Um, you know, like I said earlier, feeding a donkey or mule is not that much different than a horse if you properly manage your feeding mechanisms and schemes. Um, so you still should look at, just like when you're feeding a horse, 
okay, is this a young donkey or is this a young mule that is growing and I'm working because I'm trying to get ready for a show or I'm wanting to trail ride it? Or is this an older donkey that has really poor teeth or an older mule and I need to, you know, feed extra fat or fiber to keep weight on? So you still want to look at some of the factors you would consider um, when you're looking at how much to feed a horse. So obviously the level of work, you know, how much are they being exercised, how often are they being used during the week. Again, most of us here that use mules and donkeys for pleasure, showing recreation purposes, we never really meet a high level of work, okay? Most of our animals are probably exposed to light work. An animal that would be exposed to more extreme levels of work would be mules that are being used for endurance races or even some of your race mules that are being continually exercised for longer bouts of time that might need more protein and energy in their diets. Um, the other thing is environment, um, severe weather. If you're in the great state of Wyoming where it gets pretty cold at times, there's a wind chill factor as well as precipitation to be concerned with. That can increase the energy demand for your donkey or your mule. Um, so that's something to consider. On the opposite of an end of that, if you're from a hot and humid area, like I used to live in Georgia where it get over 100 degrees in the summer, and, 100% humidity, that's another environmental factor that might um, actually require the animal to need or require less energy one way or the other. Um, the other thing to think about is the weight of the animal. Um, I know a lot of people feed with a coffee can. Well, how big is your coffee can and what are you putting in that coffee can? A coffee can full of, of pellets compared to a coffee can full of complete feed way completely different. It looks like the same, but it's not the same. So, so consider the weight of your donkey or the weight of your mule and then what you're putting in that coffee can or, or feed scoop. And then monitor your animal's body condition and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Okay, so another thing that's pretty interesting and unique specifically about donkeys, they have been compared to small ruminants. and. A ruminant animal is an animal that has a multiple compartment stomach. They're very efficient at digesting poor quality feeds or forages. An example of a small ruminant would be a sheep or a goat. Um, generally, we think of horses, they eat enough, they increase their intake if they are receiving a poor quality food or forage. However, donkeys, they've actually done some studies in Africa looking and comparing donkeys to Bedouin goats and have found them to be almost as efficient as a goat, which as y'all know, goats can pretty much live on anything and maintain their body weight. Um, so, so donkeys have this unique ability to maintain their body weight on really um, poor forages. And again, that's why it's so hard to keep weight off of these animals. Um, we tend to think, and it's, it is a positive thought, that donkeys as well as mules can survive on less feet when compared to a horse. If you have had a chance to travel to any developing countries, you'll n normally notice that the mules and donkeys are in better shape than the horses. And keep in mind, that's not saying much, but those animals are able to utilize these poor quality forages and still have enough energy to work. Um, so the diets that are found in a lot of these developing countries where originally a lot of our donkeys originally came from, such as the African asses like the Somalian wild ass and the Nubian wild ass, um, these are very desert areas. So there's not a lot of water. The forage that they do find is extremely high in fiber, but it's low in protein and energy. The exact opposite is true here in the United States. We tend to have an abundant amount of fiber uh, I'm sorry, abundant amount of forage, which is usually lower in fiber, higher in protein and energy and things like that. Um, and the other big difference, the animals in those countries have to work for a living and most of our animals, um, they do very minimal work and they're exposed to extremely good nutrition. Um, another probably not big surprise to a lot of y'all that do own donkeys and mules, um, donkeys especially love to browse. Um, so what that means is they won't go out and just uh, consume one type of plant in a pasture setting. They'll go out and they'll eat a lot of different types of plants. And it's not uncommon for a donkey to, um, to go and find a more fibrous plant or a plant that might have thistles on it, something that your horse would never touch but maybe the goat would eat 
you can oftentimes find a donkey or a mule consuming that, as well as bark on a tree or even wooden fences. Um, another kind of unique feature to donkeys especially, and some mules also have this taste kind of uh, for tannins. There's a lot of plants such as Johnson grass, sedan grass, they're high, as well as even tobacco, they're high in something called tannins. And tannins are a part of this plant that helps it be drought resistant and, a lot of, and it has kind of a bitter taste. So a cow or goat would prefer not to eat it or a horse, but the donkeys as well as the mules tend to seek out a lot of these uh, forages that do have tannins in it. There's been a little research done looking at if there's also any correlation between tannin concentration and um, using that as an anthelmintic or a dewormer because the tannins can uh, presumably possibly kill or treat parasites. Okay, uh, Don't quote me on that, but there has been some research done on that. Um, another kind of unique feature to the donkey compared especially to the horse um, and there's been quite a bit of research, actually more than one paper, which is a lot for donkey research, looking at how a donkey's gastrointestinal tract time is actually slower compared uh, to ponies or horses. So what this basically means is the two donkeys up here in this corner munching on this Bermuda hay, they're going to eat that hay and it's going to stay in their small intestine, large intestine longer than it would say for a horse, meaning hopefully the microbial population in their hind gut um, then can spend more time digesting the source of forage, okay? Um, so there might be actually, you know, a major advantage to the donkey having this slower gastrointestinal time because when you think about where the donkey originally came from, places that are very harsh conditions, they have very limited amount of forage or food that they can consume, the longer they can digest that material and get the most out of it, the more beneficial it is for them. So that's kind of a unique, probably natural selection factor for donkeys. I don't know if this is true in mules. So all my mule owners out there wondering, well, is that the same for my mule? I'm not sure. Um, I would say probably similar to a lot of the studies that have compared donkeys, mules, and horses, the mule is probably in between the gastrointestinal time of a donkey and a horse. Again, do not know that for a fact, but making that assumption based on other studies comparing uh, the three animals. The other thing that uh, donkeys do that's a real survival tool for donkeys um, is the fact that donkeys will continue to eat during times of dehydration. There was some work that was done in the late 70s in Nevada with some BLM donkeys and they looked at how donkeys, even when they were dehydrated, had uh, no access to water for several days on end, they would still continue to eat. And again, donkeys sometimes, as well as mules, are thought to be stubborn, but they're actually highly intelligent animals. And um, this is another survival tool. If the donkey continues to eat, he's still going to have energy so he can still survive so he can go out and find a watering hole or source of water. Um, some other things that donkeys and mules obviously do and um, when we look at their big ears, those big ears serve a purpose and that's to dissipate heat. So um, when we think about again where these animals originally came from or where they live today, the large ears help in keeping the body cool as well as their coarse rough hair coat that they have. Um, and it's possible too that, um, you know, this helps in them needing less water compared to a horse of similar size because they do have the physiological abilities to dissipate heat and remain cooler. Okay, so this slide, there's a lot of information on it and I apologize it's kind of small, but it's, it's a lot of information. I just feel like it's important to share it with you. These are some tips for how to feed your long ears, okay? Um, again, this is basically a very general um, talk on how to do that, um, but the most important thing to keep in mind, and I think a lot of new owners, they tend to forget this, um, donkeys and mules are not horses with big ears, okay? If you're going to feed your donkey or you're going to feed your mule exactly the same way you feed your horse, I'll just pre-warn you, it could lead to some issues, okay? So, so, you know, treat them as their own species. Um, you really need to monitor their grass intake. 
Um, especially for your miniature, your standard donkeys that tend to look at grass and they become obese, okay? Um, consider limiting how much grazing time they have, especially for your miniatures and standards in the morning time. Um, it's best if they can graze in the morning because the plants have been dormant all evening, all night. They have the lowest amount of non-structural carbohydrates at that time. And non-structural carbohydrates are basically the sugars and starches that gives plants a lot of energy and it's basically what a horse would prefer to seek out. But we'd like to keep our donkeys from eating a lot of non-structural carbohydrates. So, so let them graze in the morning. Monitor how long they're going to be out there grazing. Um, generally, you know, the mules can graze all day. And uh, depending on the mule and its genetic background in terms of what type of mare it's out of, you know, then you might even need to supply additional forage. Um, you might even need to supply a supplementation with grain or a concentrate, depending on what you're using that mule for and then also how well it is maintaining its body weight. And the same is true for your donkeys, but generally your miniatures and standards do not have an issue staying um, in good body condition. Again, just kind of reminder, feed based on weight, not volume. Um, you're generally going to feed your mules and donkeys a lot less than you would a horse of the same size. Um, I tend to prefer high fiber, high fat diets for both mules and donkeys, um, especially your high fiber diets that are coming from non-structural carbohydrates. So this is basically the skeletal system of that plant, the lignin, the hemicellulose, the cellulose. The source of the plant that we tend to think that is not as digestible, but like we spoke of earlier, the donkey's going to keep that source of forage in its gastrointestinal time much longer than a horse and actually have the ability to break down some of these, um, these fibers. The other thing that has been looked at um, is actual microbial populations that are species specific and different in donkeys compared to horses that are more suitable to actually utilizing these uh, sources of forage that are high in fiber. Um, I mentioned the fat because fat has about two times, two and a half times more calories compared to sugar or starch. So it's an excellent way to add weight to your animal. And it's also a kind of cool, calming form of weight of, of energy that you can supply to your mule or donkey. Um, so just kind of another general rule, try not to overfeed carbohydrates, your non-structural carbohydrates that is, uh, um, or protein. Uh, and the reason I mentioned protein, and again, this is actually some research they've done with donkeys in developing um, parts of the world, and one specific study from Mexico noticed that donkeys had a really unique ability to recycle high levels of urea, okay? So, and that's when they were fed a level of 3% protein. So imagine how much urea, how much nitrogen is remaining in the kidneys, the liver, and inside that, that donkey if you're feeding a much higher protein uh, feed to your animal, okay? Um, the other thing to keep in mind, um, if you go out and purchase a donkey or a mule, and it's extremely overweight, it's obese, and you want to get some weight off of it, I caution you to do that um, in slow bouts. Do not rapidly take the weight off of that animal. That can lead to a condition called hyperlipemia, which is basically fat mobilization, um, and that can cause all sorts of liver damage and problems, and you don't want that to happen. So if you do go out and you purchase, like I said, a donkey or a mule, or you rescue one and it is extremely obese, gradually take down its feed intake, okay? Because that, cause that's the main problem um, with, our, with our obese animals. The other thing to, um, to watch for these animals that do become overweight or they are exposed to fresh green grass is laminitis. And it's more common in the hind limbs in donkeys and mules prior to the front. And it's also not uncommon for them to founder or have cases or have symptoms of laminitis in all four limbs. So that's something else that if you do have one of these animals and um, they are obese, that's something to look out for. Okay, so how do you monitor the current condition as well as the past nutritional history of, um, of how a donkey or mule has been cared for? Well, there's two different body scoring, uh, body condition scoring systems. There's a specific body condition scoring system for donkeys that's on the basis of one to five. 
it's still very similar similar to the Henneke scale of one to nine, which is uh, which was developed in the early 80s uh, to be used for horses. Um, but it's just a little simpler because there's not as much variation, in my opinion, when you're looking at fat and condition on a donkey compared to that of a horse. The other difference is where the fat is deposited on a donkey. And this scoring system that was um, founded or, or started by the Donkey Sanctuary um, and also a lady by the name of Ann Pearson did a lot of work with this, you know, recognize the anatomical differences in a donkey compared to a horse and where this fat would be deposited. So, so I highly encourage you to use this scale um, when you're looking at the overall condition of your donkeys. In terms of your mules, again, we don't have a lot of information. And depending on how that mule is bred, depending on the genetics of the mare, what type of mare, um, as well as even the type of jack, is it a standard jack, is it a mammoth jack, etc. That can have a lot of effect on how that animal is going to be made as well as how it deposits fat. And, and I would encourage you to use the Henneke scale of 1 to 9 with some caution and still use some common sense about the hips and the shoulders and things like that as well as the rib cage. Uh, because you can see, you, I've seen mules that you can see their rib cage, but then you can see fat bones on the top part of their ribs. So, you know, how do you score that? Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And something also that should be developed probably specifically for mules. All right, so here, here's kind of a scale looking at using the Donkey Sanctuary 1 to 5 scale. One, you've got a really thin donkey right here. You can count all his ribs. Uh, the pelvis, the hip bones are protruding along with the backbone. You know, the same idea as maybe an emaciated horse that's on a 1 or 2 scale. Um, a moderate donkey, you notice this donkey, you can still see his ribs. Um, his hips are prominent. Um, his withers are somewhat prominent. The neck is actually fatter than the rest of this animal, so that, that's a little different than if you looked at maybe a horse on the Henneke scale that was at a three or a four, but we'd consider this donkey to be moderate. Um, this picture right here, I would consider this donkey to be ideal. You can still see uh, kind of a slight image of his rib cage. Um, there's a little flesh covering his, um, his hips as well as, the, as well as his croup. Very smooth over his withers and his shoulder. Nice underlying. To me, this is ideally what a donkey should look like. Uh, and this would be a donkey of Catalonian and Poitou bloodline. So he's got what today we would call a standard type of donkey based on their height along with mammoth donkey, the, the larger donkeys. Um, he's got both of that in his genetics, in his background, and um, that's still how he should look, even though he's a really large donkey. Um, probably more common, a lot of the donkeys you see are your fat and obese donkeys, a four and a five. This donkey kind of falls in the middle of that, cannot see any sign of her rib cage. She's got a layer of fat over her ribs. Um, cannot tell where the hip bone is, the croup, or anything like that, and then she's also got a nice crusty neck. So I'd consider her probably a 4.5. And I've thrown a horse in here just for reference. To me, this horse would be a 5.5 to a 6, nice and round and fat. It was a horse I saw over in Ireland, and I just think that's a nice reference to look at the difference in the smoothness of the condition over the skeletal system of the donkey compared to the horse. Okay, well, what about mules? Now you've taken an animal that varies in his genetic background on both ends, okay? Again, I'm using the horse as a reference. Um, this mule right here, to me, is an ideal condition. Um, you can still you see where the hip is, you can tell where the croup is, but there's a nice finish over, over this mule's top line, and it's not too much of a finish. Um, I generally like to see the underline tucked up just a little more, but this is a really big animal, and so this is fine and adequate when you look at his belly and his underline. Um, and on him, you're just really never going to see his ribs based on his breeding, okay? Again, I, I refer to my little mule from India down here. Um, you know, this mule's in decent shape. If we're using the Henneke system, you'd probably say a 4.5 because the hips are protruding. Um, you can't really tell it in this picture, but you could see its ribs. Anyway, moving on to my race mule here on the walker. 
This mule's in excellent condition also. And if this mule had as much condition as this mule up here, he wouldn't be able to run as well. So we'd probably call this race mule about a 4.5 and it's in really nice shape, adequate amount of finish. Um, and then this mule, um, again, the picture's a little dark, but it would be on the extreme end of being obese. It was covered in fat pones over, um, and when I say fat pones, I'm talking about the fat deposition, large amounts of fat deposition concentrated in one area. Um, her tail head and her croup is lumpy along with her neck, which is very thick and crusty along with her top line and the ribs. So we don't want to get our mules looking like that, okay? All right, so here's some species differences in terms of comparing donkeys and mules. The information on this slide is probably pretty important if your mule or your donkey ever gets sick and needs to go to a veterinarian or needs to go to a vet hospital. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly go through this, but this is more information you might wanna write down or come back later and record uh, because it makes a difference in if your mule is really healthy or your donkey's really healthy or is this, um, or is he really sick, okay? So some of the uh, differences in a donkey, and, and these values are compared back to a horse, okay? They lack the presence of the reticulocytes. They have fewer but larger um, erythrocytes. They have a higher mean value for corpus, corpuscular uh, volume, the MCV, okay? Um, the other thing that's quite different in our miniature donkeys compared to our mammoths or our standards is the fact that the serum lactate dehydrogenase, an enzyme, is much higher for miniature donkeys compared to our other two donkey uh, groups. So if you're a veterinarian or owner treating that animal and you didn't know that was the norm, you know, you might think that animal is really sick. Um, and that's the gist of this whole slide is to know that there's some major differences in blood chemistry hematocrit and even vital signs for donkeys compared to horses and mules compared to horses, okay? The other thing you'll notice um, that liver enzymes, uh, specifically creatine kinase and glutamyl transferase are much higher in a donkey. Um, these two enzymes in horses are around 33 or so where they're close to 70 to 100 in a donkey. So that's a huge difference and something that's important to note. Another thing that's important to note, because if you are monitoring the health of your donkey, is the normal body temperature, the normal rectal temperature for donkey, tends to run lower than that for a horse. And that is 98.6 compared to a horse, we generally say is around 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Heart rate sometimes is a little bit higher, just you know, looking at the average, horses can range anywhere from 30 to 45 beats per minute, again, depending on the horse environment, things like that, and that can change, uh, it can be a diurnal um, effect. Uh, respiration tends to be a little bit higher too in donkeys, 21 breaths per minute at rest compared to say eight to 16 breaths per minute. Unfortunately, in the mule, I do not have any heart rate data, respiration, uh, data available for you, but I do have some information that I recently gathered um, this past fall on looking at some of the blood hematocrit and chemistry values and how they compared to a horse. Um, so we found comparing the um, some of these parameters to a horse such as the MCV to be higher um, and, and some of these different um, values relate to if the immune system is working, if that animal is anemic, if there's an infection or, or things like that. So, so it's important to, and if a veterinarian or someone wants to read this and see these are higher values, oftentimes that can send an alarm to that practitioner thinking, well, something is not working right, you know. So, but it, so it's nice to have a reference value. Um, in general, there's a lower white blood cell count in a mule, lower lymphocytes, um, lower monocytes, Red blood cells tend to be lower than horses, and the mean platelet volume tends to be lower. Um, and I've given you some references there. Again, this data has not been published yet, but hopefully will be soon. Um, and the normal temperature for a mule was similar to that of a horse. There wasn't a large difference. Um, I highly recommend you getting a copy of the AEP proceedings from 2002, where they actually had a whole special lecture with some experts in the mule and donkey industry veterinarians that came in 
and spoke about a lot of this information that I'm sharing with you today. Okay, so let's briefly look at some anatomical differences in the donkey compared to the mule compared to the horse. Um, and I have all three of these pictures on here so you can look at kind of how the horse is made compared to the donkey and then compared to their offspring, the mule. Okay, so the donkey in general, um, just starting out with the way a donkey talks to other animals. Um, they have a little bit of a different whinny. They don't really whinny, they bray. And again, for my audience that owns mules and donkeys, this is nothing new to you, but why, why do they produce a different kind of sound compared to our horse? And that's due to their laryngeal anatomy. They actually have a different structure to their throat, to their esophagus, their trachea, and things like that that produce this different sound that we call a bray. Um, so some of these are kind of fun facts. Um, another thing that's different compared to a donkey to a horse is the fact that no ear gots are found on the hind legs. Um, and that probably goes back to when the horse evolved from a small eohippus, the dawn horse, up to the modern horse we know today, and those toes were descending up the limb of the horse. It's possible the donkey didn't have five toes in the hind end. Maybe they were in a drier area compared to the marshy area that Eohippus was first found in. Um, so there's no ear gots on the inside of the back hind legs. Um, their hooves, as we know, are quite small. They're very boxy. A donkey tends to have a lot of heel and not much toe. And their hoof will be oftentimes much smaller than that of a horse compared to that at the same height, okay? Another unique anatomical difference is the fact that um, on male donkeys, on their sheath, it's not unusual to see teats on either side. Um, the other thing that's important to know, especially if you go to draw blood intravenously from a donkey, is the fact that they have a much thicker cutaneous coli muscle. And that's the muscle that's protecting the jugular vein. So when you go to insert a needle, especially in an obese donkey or even obese mule, it's much harder to find that vein. It's harder to go through their thicker skin and, and find the jugular, okay? Um, and that probably goes back to, again, a natural selection factor um, in the fact that uh, donkeys, when they do fight, especially jacks, they will go towards that jugular, towards the throat latch. Um, for fighting, so that's probably why that evolved to be so much thicker than that of a horse, um, as well as the jugular furrow being deeper than that of a horse. Generally, uh, just like with this donkey, you see the withers are less prominent, um, the hips tend to be more prominent, and then the sternum usually protrudes out more than that of a horse. Another thing that's worth noting is that a donkey has a longer gestation period than a horse, it's about 12 months. They also tend to live longer than a horse, okay? So it's not that uncommon to find donkeys 30 and 40 years old. However, when we're aging donkeys, there are some dental differences um, in terms of how the teeth erupt. Um, they don't exactly match that of a horse. The angle of incidence um, is a little bit steeper. Um, so those are some things that are different when you are aging a donkey. You might age it to be um, younger than it really is because a donkey at the age of 10 will not appear to have a smooth mouth like a lot of horses will. Um, some other anatomical differences, um, there's a difference in the opening of the guttural pouches um, as well as a difference in the angle of the airway going into the guttural pouches and into the trachea. Um, and that presents some problems when we go to use a nasal, uh, a nasal tube in donkeys. Oftentimes, um, a practitioner will have to use a smaller diameter tube and a stiffer tube in order to pass a nasal tube through a donkey. It also can, uh, we can run into some problems when we're trying to use an endoscope on a donkey because of this smaller, more narrow passageway as well as the angle being more severe. Okay. So, um, the, the mule, what about the mule? Um, they have, like we've already spoken about, combined traits of the donkey and the horse. And the picture I have right here is a gated mule. So this mule tends to have more traits that are more similar to a gated horse, like a Tennessee walking horse. So you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at some of these physical differences. 
Um, they obviously have longer ears. Their vocalization is similar to that of a donkey, but not quite as deep and long of a bray as a donkey because it's still mixed with that of the horse, okay? Uh, generally, mules have more prominent withers than most of our donkeys, but again, that varies depending on the genetic makeup of that mule. Uh, when you compare a mule out of a thoroughbred compared to a draft horse, the drafts a lot of times will have much flatter, broader backs and withers. So, um, got to keep in mind how is this animal bred. Um, the head sometimes is larger than that of a horse, but not as large as a donkey. And so that presents some problems when we try to find halters and bridles and headstalls and things like that that adequately fit this unique hybrid animal. Typically, we will find ergots on the hind limbs, on the back end. So, so that must be passed on from the horse side of their heritage, if they're a henny or a mule. Um, and as we all know that if we do ride mules and donkeys, finding tack that fits appropriately can obviously be difficult. And if that tack doesn't properly fit, a lot of times we wind up on the ground or in bad situations, sore backs and things like that. Um, so some other things that mules oftentimes prefer is to be turned out compared to stalled. Um, again, they have personal preference, just like some horses prefer to be turned out, but generally speaking, a lot of mules would prefer to be out in a pasture. Um, both mules and donkeys are very social animals. They prefer companionships, but mules especially can get very buddy soured over being very close to another horse or to another mule. Um, and donkeys will actually even really go through a mourning stage if they lose their companion. They become very attached. Um, another thing, and I don't like to spend a lot of time about it, but um, a lot of times you will find your mules and, and even some of your donkeys will have what we call quirks. Uh, and you will probably also find the longer you have your mule, you're going to have to deal with that quirk or that issue versus trying to correct it. And the biggest one we probably see in a lot of our mules is the fact a lot of them are ear shy or they're hard to catch. And yeah, that can be true in a horse too, but it seems like a lot of our mules in some ways are more severe in terms of them being ear shy and hard to catch. Um, and the ear shyness then obviously presents an issue when you go to bridle them, but there are some bridles available that actually clip behind the ears of the mule and um, that way it just it takes all that fuss and fight out. There are also some special head stalls made for donkeys that appreciate their nice broad foreheads as well as their large ears because you have a lot of issues sometimes trying to fit a normal horse size head stall on a donkey and, and even some mules depending on the mule's heritage. Um, in my experience, the food reward system generally works well in training systems, especially one that's hard to catch. You got there with a treat, or you got there with a little bucket of grain, and that seems to be much easier than chasing them around a pasture because they don't tend to tire as quickly as a horse. So um, that is a piece of advice I would like to offer in terms of maybe how to work with some of these quirks. Um, like the donkey, uh, mules especially, if they do develop fat pones, they can still be in moderate body condition. So, so just keep that in mind too. Um, you might see a mule in good body shape also with fat pones, okay? So that's another anatomical difference you wouldn't really see in a horse. If a horse has fat pones, he's probably gonna be fat all over. Okay, so just to get into a little bit about pharmacokinetics in uh, donkeys and somewhat in mules, there are some differences when you go to anesthetize or to sedate one of these unique long-eared hybrids or animals, um, especially looking at donkeys. Donkeys, kind of like um, in terms of how they metabolize their nutrients, they have a, um, a unique ability to metabolize pharmaceutical products extremely rapidly. Um, and they also can, um, an example of that would be like nascents such as but or banamine. Um, if you're administering but or banamine to your donkey, you're probably going to have to administer it more frequently and at a much higher dose than you would for a horse of the same size or the same weight. Um, the mule tends to be closer to the horse and how he metabolizes nascents or other, um, or um, sedation or um, 
drugs used for anesthetizing animals. But in terms of nasids, your mule will be generally close to your horse. You still might have to increase the dosage um, as well as how many times you administer it compared, again, to a regime that you would utilize uh, when treating a horse for some type of uh, soundness or um, discomfort issue. So um, just in general, veterinarians, and again, your veterinarian is a very intelligent person. They probably know this because there has been such a huge increase in interest in the mule and donkey population. But um, if they don't, you can always ask them and refer with them. Um, you know, ask them about using a larger dose on a donkey compared to a horse with similar body weight. Um, this is especially true for my miniature donkey owners out there. So even though it's a cute little fuzzy miniature, he might need the same amount as a 14-hand horse, okay? Um, and he might, like I said, metabolize that in a much shorter period of time. Miniatures seem to respond best to um, a sedative called xylazine, or the common name would be rompum, and then butyrophanerol, okay? Um, I really discourage the use of ACE in mules as well as donkeys. My experience using ACE promazine is that it increases the excitatory factor, and instead of them calming down, they get even more excited. So I would caution you on using that and would prefer that you look at something like the xylazine or the demorcidam. But again, um, you know, go back and re, uh, consult with your veterinarian on that. Um, so again, just looking at the pharmacokinetics and the differences. Um, so mules, for our most part, are going to be similar to horses. However, the sedation oftentimes wears off quicker, okay? So the dose you're going to be used is similar to a horse, but it still might wear off quicker, so you might have to go back and re-sedate or you think about that. Um, anyhow, the other thing and the reason why you see a difference in the sedation factor with mules when you are trying to sedate them or anesthetize them is because of the genetic variability in terms of is this mule out of a hot-blooded mare, is she out of something that has bred to be very excited and react quickly, or is she out, of, or is this mule out of a cold-blooded mare that's nice and docile, and you're going to sedate them, and they're going to stay sedated because of the behavioral difference in the dam. Um, so generally speaking, mules um, require about 50% more xylazine uh, to produce an adequate uh, sedation. Um, and that's before you administer the, um, the ketamine, okay? That information comes from a paper on anesthetizing donkeys and mules that was written by Dr. Nora Matthews, and you can look that up in the AEP uh, proceedings from 2002, which I will later uh, give you a link to. So, so anyway, I didn't make that up. That came from a veterinarian, and she's actually an anesthesiologist for Texas A&M University that's done about 20 years of research looking at uh, anesthetizing donkeys and mules and their differences to horses. Okay, um, the other issue is some of these drugs that are used to anesthetize or sedate donkeys especially can cause issues and complications with breathing and I'd like to refer you back to that paper for the specifics on the actual pharmaceutical products that have issues with that. Um, so when you're working with your veterinarian to have any type of surgery done or you're going to sedate your animal, I would highly recommend pulling these papers and conferring with them and getting their insight on how they think it's best to sedate or restrain your animal. Um, this picture right down here, I want to point out real quick before I move on. Um, if you notice, there's a string tied around this donkey's neck. Um, and this technique was taught to me by a very famous veterinarian by the name of Dr. Tex Taylor. He was a surgeon at Texas A&M University and basically, in my opinion, the godfather of donkey medicine. And we spoke of earlier how it's much harder to find that jugular vein in the donkey because of the muscle covering it, the cutaneous coli muscle, is so much thicker than that compared to a horse. So he showed me this unique little trick. You just take a piece of baling twine, and, and Dr. Taylor was just a genius man, but he was also just amazing at finding a very simple solution to a hard problem. And so this is his solution. You find a piece of baling twine or a small piece of rope, and then you tie off around that donkey's neck, and then what that does, that constricts the blood, and that vein pops right up so you can find it 
and then you can put in your catheter or your needle for intravenous injection or whatever it is you need to do. And then, of course, you would obviously release that um, when you have done your injection or inserted your catheter. Okay, so some other management areas that I'm going to touch on briefly um, is looking at parasite control in donkeys and mules. Both are susceptible to a type of parasite called lungworms and they can serve as host and a lot of times this is a concern of horse owners if their horses are being stalled or pastured with a donkey or a mule and as we know donkeys make great companion animals and a lot of times are housed and uh, kept with very high dollar horses. Anyway, um, well, we don't want to pass on our lungworms. So a way that you can treat that is using uh, the anthelminic ivermectin. Um, so that, that's one thing I would encourage you to look into. Um, even if you're doing a fecal egg count, I would still consider using ivermectin at least once a year with your donkeys and mules to um, prevent lungworms and the spread of that. Donkeys are also very susceptible to skin parasites such as lice and flies. It's just amazing to me that these are such tough animals and they live in such harsh environments and work in these environments, yet they come to the U.S. where they don't have to really work for a living and we give them all this great food and the flies just eat them alive. Um, and we'll actually, I've seen them eat, especially around the cannons, you know, just down to a bloody um, area. So um, that's something to keep in mind, you know, consider using fly mask. Um, there's a company that makes special fly masks for donkeys and mules. It allows for their bigger ears. Um, and there's, sort, you know, there's all sorts of fly wraps you can put on their legs. Um, so, I, you know, I'd, I'd highly encourage you to look at ways to prevent your donkey or your mule to being so susceptible and exposed to these flies in the summertime. The other issue with lice, very common in emaciated donkeys. Just about every emaciated donkey you can find if you go out to a sale to buy one or you're rescuing one, look for the lice and you'll be able to see the lice attached to, um, attached to the hair follicles. Um, you know, you'll see the white eggs and you'll even be able to see the brown biting uh, lice there. When you get rid of the lice, then that animal will be able to pick back weight, um, pick weight back up. And I've also even seen the lice on some of our fatter, healthy donkeys. So it just, I guess the lice enjoy the taste of, of a donkey. Um, have not noticed the lice as prevalent in mules. Okay, so jack sores is another issue and you see the hawks of this donkey right here. There's a lot of um, conversation over what really jack sores are. You have probably read and heard some saying that um, this is because donkeys are fed too much protein and they can't digest the protein, so it causes this large edema on the hawk and it oozes out. Um, I've heard the same theory about feeding donkeys uh, to a high load of non-structural carbohydrates. Um, in all reality, uh, it might have some type of um, nutrient relationship, but that has not been studied. We do know that we typically see these sores in the summer of the year, and yes, the grass is greener and it is higher in non-structural carbohydrates, but what happens after this swelling occurs, then we see sores, sometimes referred to as summer sores, or more commonly jack sores. And if you go in and you take a biopsy of that sore, you'll oftentimes find remnants or you'll actually find a parasite called cutaneous habermasum or the stomach worm. And that can be treated with moxidectin, okay, or ivermectin, all right. Very hard to treat. They tend to get it year after year. They also seem to be more commonly found in our mammoth donkeys, the really large donkeys, jacks 14, two hands and taller, okay. Um, the other piece of advice I'd like to share with you in terms of basic health care management. While your mule or donkey is healthy, have your veterinarian pull some blood, run his blood chemistry, run his hematocrit data, see what his normal glucose, insulin, things like that are, check his body temperature. That way when you do have a problem later on, you have a normal values to compare to, okay? So I highly recommend you do that. 
Okay, so a few other areas of health care, and again, a lot of this is common sense, especially for those of y'all who have owned donkeys or mules for a while. Donkeys tend to have a really hard time with wet conditions. And again, we look back at the origins of the African donkeys and the wild donkey species. They come from a desert. They don't come from wet type areas. Um, so wet conditions tend to lead to hoof abscesses, white line disease, and stuff like that. Um, Again, watch for founder, watch for the development of laminitis in the hind hooves as well as the front. Very common for our donkeys to founder back there prior to foundering in the front. Um, the other thing, and I'm sorry this picture has cut it off, caution should be exercised when you're castrating jacks, okay, so they don't bleed to death. The reproductive organs of a jack, which is the male donkey, are much larger than that compared to a horse of same size. But one major problem is the blood vessels are also much larger. Um, and when your veterinarian goes to castrate the donkey, you want to make sure and you want to talk to them about litigating or tying off the spermatic vessels so he does not bleed to death. And they can go in and do that with an absorbable suture, okay? A lot of great donkeys have passed away because they've been castrated, especially jacks that are castrated at an older age. And a lot of developing countries actually won't even touch or deal with castrating because of this side effect. All right, so let's touch a little bit on donkey and mule behavior because like we said, they're, they're not horses with big ears and they don't act like horses a lot of times. But I think that's one of the things that draws a lot of people to the ownership of a donkey or mule is because they are so, you know, independent and different in terms of how they negotiate different situations. So remember, especially when a donkey is sick, donkeys are very stoic animals. Um, they're not going to tell you they're sick. They're tougher than everything and it's a survival mechanism. They're not going to let you know they're dead until they're pretty much dead, okay? Especially with a donkey that's colicky. Usually it's a chronic colic, it's not acute, they're not going to give you all the signs, they're not going to look at their flanks. So be aware of your donkey's behavior. You see any subtle changes in food intake, water intake, his general behavior out in the pasture or in a stall setting, you probably ought to call the vet, okay? Um, mules tend to be, thank goodness, a little more like horses, and they will show signs of acute pain, but generally it's easier, thank goodness, like I said, for our mule owners, we can detect there is an issue. However, both of these animals have a much higher pain tolerance in general compared to a horse. So even though our mule is going to show us that he might be lame, he might have been really lame for a long time before he finally said, I can only stand on three legs, okay? So, so listen to their body language and, uh, you know, be very intuitive to their, to their actions and behavior. Um, some other differences when you're restraining a donkey or mule so you can uh, shoe that animal or you can do veterinary work, you know, pull blood or you can administer an anthelmintic. You need to consider how you're going to restrain the donkey or mule. As we know, they're extremely strong animals, um, sometimes too strong for their own good and they have a lot of power in moving their head and neck, especially compared to a horse. Or they have a lot of power in leaning all their body weight on you when you go to pick up a hoof. Um, so I, I really highly recommend and avoid ear twitching. I believe that leads to a lot of our uh, ear shyness issues. Um, they look like big handlebars. You just want to reach up there and twitch. But donkeys and mules are not very forgiving. And if that causes pain, probably next time they're not going to want you to touch their ears. And that presents issues with bridling and haltering and things like that. Consider a twitch or pharmaceutical restraint. You know your mule doesn't like the farrier. Consider the twitch and consider having the veterinarian administer something like xylazine or demorcidan. So it's a more pleasurable experience for everyone involved. Um, donkeys in general, there has been some studies that have shown that donkeys tend to respond less to the twitch than say a mule or a horse would. Um, their heart rate never resides back to a normal level. level. It actually stays elevated. Cortisol remains high, um, so, so you just don't have this kind of overall calming effect that some believe the twitch um, stimulates by putting that pressure on the nose similar to acupuncture. That, that has not been proven or shown in the donkey yet. Okay, 
So a few other um, management areas in terms of behavior. When you're working with mules and donkeys, if you don't have patience, I don't advise you to own one. You have to have lots of patience. They really test that. Um, again, I'm you know a big fan of trying the reward system because there's no way you can really outpower one of these animals without really having to get harsh and brutal. And um, I don't know, I'm not a big person. It's easier for me to use a kinder, easier method like food. The other thing is, uh, it's kind of like having a Mac computer compared to a PC. There's a difference, I think, in learning how they utilize the two. Um, so I think you have to be a little bit smarter than your mule or donkey, kind of like, are you smarter than your computer? Um, so, so think your plan through before attempting to execute it. So if you know your mule will only load with a can of feed or with another horse on the trailer, go get the other horse and then load them. Um, you know, don't try to pick a fight because once they learn not to do something, they generally don't do it. And I have a picture down here of me and my mule going over a bridge and he's not a fan of crossing bridges. And he learned that a long time ago. When he was young, he went across one of these small wooden bridges and fell off of it and it scared him. And he's never gotten over it. He does everything else in the world, but he does not like crossing bridges. So, so they have a great memory. They don't forget, okay? Um, the other thing I highly encourage y'all to do, especially if you're into raising mules or donkeys, especially your mule foals, get your hands on it. Don't wait until it's a yearling to touch. There seems to be something with the human mule bond. Um, if you don't start gaining the trust of that mule the day it's born, it's not going to have your trust later on. It's just gonna be a lot more difficult to deal with. So, so I highly recommend you doing some form of, of imprinting or socialization to that mule foal when it's born. The donkeys in general, the, with my experience, tend to come out of their mom, just want to know who you are and what's going on in the rest of the world. And it um, doesn't seem to make a difference if you spend a lot of time with them or not. But again, you know, some people might have had different experiences. So, so I do highly recommend you start your training as soon as that animal is born. Okay, so in terms of reproduction, um, there's obviously some differences when we talk about breeding a jack, a male donkey, to a horse, or looking at breeding a stallion to a jenny, to a, to a female donkey to produce a henny. Um, think about the environment where you're going to breed this animal. Some people do pasture breed, but a lot of people prefer to hand breed because some jacks can be very aggressive and, um, you know, a lot of donkeys that are being bred today are highly prized animals, they're very valued, and, and the, the jack owner does not want that jack to get hurt. So, so a lot of mules today are made in um, terms of, of hand breeding or either um, your more innovative breeders are actually collecting these donkeys and shipping semen and some have even successfully frozen jack semen. Um, so there seems to be two types of breeding jacks. One that's going to take all day long, he's going to watch the birds fly by, or the one that's going to drag you and your 10 best friends to the mare that might not even be in heat and try to breed her. So, you know, you've got some differences there. Um, so, you know, keep in mind too that there's some species differences in terms of a jack that will breed a mare compared to a jenny. Not all jacks will breed jennies, even though that's his own kind, and not all jacks will breed mares. Um, generally, if a jack is raised or a donkey is raised around horses, that's not an issue. Um, a lot of your breeders will train a jack to breed a mare and then later on transfer them over to a jenny or either collect them and artificially inseminate the jenny. There tends to be more problems when we reverse this and we ask a stallion to breed a jenny. When a jenny is in estrus, when she's in heat, she displays this kind of weird stance and rises her tail and then she does what's called mouth clamping or clapping and, and opens her mouth um, very rapidly. And the stallions that see this, they're, they're not very excited about this posture and this animal they're about to breed. So, so a lot of breeders will either try to collect the stallion and artificially inseminate the jenny when they're trying to make a henny. Um, some stallions don't have a problem, they will breed a jenny, so um, that's one you want to keep in mind for henny production. Other things that can be used is mare urine, um, and some people have even said that blindfolding their stallion when they lead it up to mount the jenny has worked. Um, again, no scientific data on that. Um, 
The other thing to keep in mind in terms of donkey reproduction, some jennies um, can cycle all year long. So, you know, consider when you want to have that foal. And a lot of that has to do with where that donkey originally came from, which part of the earth that donkey originated from. Your donkeys that are from Mediterranean tropical areas, you will see them cycling all year long because they had a source of forage or they had a source of food originally at all times. Your other donkeys, the reason why they cycle maybe only in the spring through the summer is because where they're originally from goes through either a dry period or a wet period, so they don't want to have a fall in the dry period when there's nothing for it to eat. So those are also some natural selection probably differences. Um, something that I caution you to be aware of, especially with your mammoth donkeys, is twinning. There seems to be a higher incidence of twinning in mammoth donkeys, so um, go in and check that Jenny, you know, 20 to 22 days after she's been bre been bred, you know, and look for a twin in there. Um, generally, they don't survive. Some do, but it's easier on the Jenny if, if we don't have a twin situation. Another issue that is a, a problem, especially with some mules, is neonatal isorolysis or NI. And this is where the mule foal basically cannot consume the colostrum, the first milk of the mare, because the antibodies, the immunoglobins that are found in that colostrum will actually attack that mule system. This goes back to a difference in blood types and crossing the two different species. You can have your blood drawn about a month prior to that mare foaling. You can send it to the University of California at Davis, and they can test for this condition. And if it's found, then you can uh, keep, you can prevent your mule foal from nursing that mare and supplement it with colostrum or plasma and prevent the death of that foal. But that is a condition to be aware of when you are raising mules is neonatal isorolysis or NI. Okay, so just to wrap up things, um, this is a list of the sources that I've used for today's talk. The AEP proceedings that I've mentioned a lot, here's a link to them, they're PDFs. I highly encourage you to go print them off, have a copy for you, have a copy for your veterinarian. If you sell donkeys or mules, I highly um, suggest you give this to a new donkey or mule owner. A lot of your donkey owners um, are people that don't own horses or they've never owned a horse before and they see it more as a companion animal. So, so if I have any people in the audience that are like that, I hope this will be helpful to you as well as your veterinarian. Um, the Donkey Sanctuary also a lot of times puts out a lot of donkey research and information. There's a link for that. Um, as well as the International Veterinary Information Service. There's a lot um, there's a lot more scientific information found on that site in terms of studies that have been done. Uh, primarily with donkeys, but some with mules, and they're from all around the world. They're from parts of the world like Mexico or Ethiopia or China, where there's a lot of mules, a lot of donkeys, and this is information and data that veterinarians and researchers have gathered in those countries. So um, for the time being, that's what we have to rely on since there is very limited information for mules and hennies. With that, I thank you for your time and for uh, logging in and joining the webcast and I hope you found that helpful. Um, I know there's a, still a lot of unanswered questions out there but I, I hope that at least addressed most of your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. McLean. You have just a minute to look at some of the questions that are in the text chat and uh, maybe answer just a couple. Um, yes, Amanda, I, I see there's a lot of questions jumping up. Wow, we maybe could have done two sessions of this. Um, I noticed one of the questions that uh, referred to um, a leader in the industry, Meredith Hodges, and she referred to only feeding rolled oats um, to, to donkeys and mules. You know, my suggestion on what you feed, as long as you keep that animal in good body condition, and I was actually at Meredith's house yesterday, 
And she has a lot of mules and donkeys that are in their 20s and 30s, and they're in phenomenal shape. They look fantastic. So rolled oats have worked really well for her program. But the other thing that she has done, she's also exercised these, these mules and donkeys, and she, you know, she has a very strict exercise regime with them. And she's also fed extremely good uh, you know, grass hay. She's limited their grazing, and she's looked at things like that. So sure, rolled oats can work. Um, I have, have used um, other um, commercially offered feed because to me, a whole grain can vary in terms of nutrient content, you know, when it was harvested, what section of the, of the um, land it was harvested from. And so I just prefer to use a commercially made feed. Um, I prefer pellets or either a complete feed that's, like I said, high in fiber, high in fat. And we travel so much showing our mules. I, I like to have something that I can go and get almost anywhere. So we use a commercial feed that's a national company. Um, again, there's a lot of questions coming in here. Um, I see another one that says, uh, limit grass, hay, or just fresh grass. Again, this is where you're going to have to consider your unique situation, what body condition score your animal is at, um, and, you know, is your animal approaching being obese? If it's not, then turn it out, let it graze in the morning. Um, and if that's still not enough, then, you know, if you're living in an environment like Wyoming or Michigan where it doesn't get cold, then you might actually need to supplement with hay. So, so in terms of limiting grass or hay, you're going to have to use, um, you know, your management situation and to, to look at that. Um, I see another question asked, what can you do to treat for neck disease? And I'm not quite sure what they're referring to. And if you are referring to the crest of a neck that oftentimes will roll over on a donkey, um, there's no cure for that, unfortunately. It's, it's going to be like that from now on. Um, so try not to get your donkey overweight. And as you noticed, even in some of those pictures, such as my friend's donkey, um, it's in great uh, ideal weight, it's exercised on a regular basis, but due to its genetic makeup, to take all the energy it gets and to store that as a fat source in case there is a famine situation, it can mobilize that fat, you know, that's something we just have to deal with in having this species of equid. So, uh, and I'm also seeing a lot of comments about, can we do another show? So I don't know, that's up to my horse university. Um, well, well, thank you. I think maybe that's a good segue into ending. If you could just mute your mic for a sec so I could conclude, that would be great. Okay. Thank you so much, Amy, for that presentation. Obviously, um, everyone liked it, and maybe uh, we will have to try to schedule a follow-up so we can talk more about it and get some more questions answered, um, but we really appreciate your time. And thank you so much, all of you, for participating tonight. Um, I know that we didn't get a chance to answer a lot of these questions, but like I said, maybe we'll try to schedule a round two. Um, so check in with us on myhorseuniversity.com and see what's coming next. But we do know right now that for um, January, our free monthly webcast is on the topic of finding your dream job in the U.S. horse industry. So maybe some of you will be interested in that, and you can go to our website to register online. Um, and that will be presented by several faculty members from equine programs around the country. Um, and it will also provide a preview to an equine business conference that we'll be hosting in February. Uh, so again, register online. And also, again, our, presenta our presentation tonight was recorded, so we'll post it to our website by the end of the week. You can find that at myhorseuniversity.com as well, along with a lot of other archived webcasts. So if you have any uh, questions or feedback for us, you can email us at info at myhorseuniversity.com, or you can call us at 517-353-3123. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So again, thanks and have a great night.